Order. It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour, and the member will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. Acting Prime Minister on ministerial arrangements. Mr Speaker, before informing the House of some adjusted arrangements, could I take this opportunity, perhaps on behalf of all members, to wish our Socceroos every success this weekend in what I hope, in what I hope will be a peaceful match at that magnificent Mecca, the MCG. Mr Speaker, I inform the House that the Minister for Defence, Industry, Science and Personnel, the Hon. Bronwyn Bishop, will be absent from question time today. Mrs Bishop is addressing the British Aerospace Australia UK Business Forum in Sydney, from which I have just returned. The Minister for Defence, the Hon. Ian McLaughlin, will answer questions on Mrs Bishop's behalf. I also inform the House that the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, the Hon. John Anderson, will be absent from question time today. Mr Anderson is travelling to Victoria for Murray-Darling Basin Ministerial uh, Council commitments. And the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Hon. Bruce Scott, will answer questions on his behalf. I thank the Acting Prime Minister. Questions without notice to uh, Mr. the Speaker, Honourable Leader I, of the Opposition. I, I join with the uh, Acting Prime Minister and his best wishes to the uh, Socceroos. I, I think they'll come with slightly less of handicap than they had the other night when uh, they had 110,000 people, 120,000 people roaring against them. Hopefully it'll be sort of 80,000 the other way. Uh, the question to the, my question is to the Acting Prime Minister. Can he confirm that his office told the Sydney Morning Herald that the letter written by his senior policy consultant, Mr Terry Ryan, saying freehold title could be threatened by native title was, quote, not very well worded and, quote, there was no intention to suggest that WIC had any impact on freehold title, unquote. If this is the case, why has he allowed the Special Minister for State to persist with such disgraceful and untrue claims in the media today, especially when he knows the High Court has three times ruled 7 0 that freehold extinguishes native title. The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. And, uh, he refers to a letter written some six months ago. And, uh, he then refers to uh, advice from my office, apparently, to the Sydney Morning Herald last night. And I have no reason to disavow him of that advice because, in fact, WIC was a judgment on leasehold, not freehold. And in terms of that, uh, I have no particular uh, complaint. But I want to take this opportunity to say that the issue of freehold is back on the agenda, not because of any letter written six months ago, but because of Labor's amendments to our WIC legislation. Oh. Members on my left. And, and the, House, the House is entitled to an explanation in relation Order. to that statement. Firstly, Deputy firstly, Leader of the Opposition. Firstly, firstly, the High Court has not ruled specifically on freehold. It has passed. It has passed. Comment by way of an obiter dicta, not an actual judgment, which said, which said, which said that freehold and leasehold properly issued extinguishes native title. Now we agree that was in Mabo too. I agree with the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that that uh, statement in Australia that freehold and leasehold properly issued extinguishes native title. But what then happened? Secondly, the High Court returned to this issue in a specific judgment which in effect overturned one half of that statement. It said that in respect of leasehold, in respect of leasehold, there will now be the concept of coexistence. Leasehold Member no longer Banks. completely extinguishes native title. That is an absolute statement in respect of the WIC judgment, which then, which then went on to give a postscript, which then went on to give a postscript, and I, I freely acknowledge a postscript, which said that where there was conflict between pastoral leasehold uh, entitlements uh, and native title, the uh, rights of the pastoral leaseholder will in fact prevail. Thirdly, our, 
the honourable member for O'Connor. The member for Kingsford Smith just accused the uh, the acting prime minister of using a congenital lie. I ask him withdraw that, and I remind the house there are claims over freehold land in Bremer Bay, and they have the been issued member by for the National Labor Party. Will resume his seat. I warn the member for O'Connor. I warn the member for O'Connor. The honourable member for Kingford Smith, member for Brisbane. I did not accuse the, him of being a congenital liar. That is not what I said. Line. <laughs> That's what I thought. I thank the uh, honourable member for Kingford Smith. Uh, I, I, Thirdly, the acting Prime Minister, as I understood it, the word thirdly, I heard was Thirdly, it lying. is a matter of fact there has been claims submitted over freehold. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll give you one specific example. It relates to Narendra in the electorate of Riverina. And both the federal member for Riverina and I went to Narendra and we were confronted earlier this year with claims over actual residential freehold in the town of Narendra. And what our legislation seeks to do, and why there is a rising passion with regard to our legislation, is that we seek to fully protect freehold as an effective title in relation to which native title is extinguished. But what we found last night, late last night, is that the official circulated list of Labor amendments seeks to strike out this protection of freehold, which we are seeking to provide. This is the nub of the matter. Your amendments to Division 2B seeks to strike out the exclusive possession confirmation that we provide for freehold. So it also, Labor's legislation also seeks to delete Schedule 4. True or false? True. Okay. Labor's legislation, Labor's amendments to our amendments seeks to delete Schedule 4, which provides confirmation of exclusive possession with regard to certain categories of pastoral leasehold. So now we are getting to the nub of this debate. You have had it far too easy, too long, with too many inaccuracies in relation to this debate. I want to say, Mr Speaker, Lord. that all we seek to do in our legislation is to provide fairness and certainty and provision of native title remains on mainland Australia and in fact up to 79 per cent of mainland Australia can be claimed. The issue of freehold is around only because Labor will not support the Coalition's confirmation of certainty and security over freehold land. We are for certainty, freehold and jobs. The Honourable Member for Point Petrie. The, uh, before I call the Honourable Member for Petrie, the no, Leader right. of the House. Uh, uh, my point of I order is this, uh, Mr Speaker. The uh, Member for Kingsford. Order. I saw your amendment late last the, night. The your Acting amendment. Prime Minister. The Member for Kingsford Smith uh, came to the dispatch box and withdrew two words. Uh, I understood you were about to, you were about to interrupt uh, with. Uh, or, I'm sorry, claimed that he hadn't ushered, uh, uttered two words. I thought you were about to interrupt the Deputy Prime Minister, Mr Speaker. I did hear the member for Kingsford Smith it's use the word liar, and he ought to be he ought to be required to withdraw it. It is, Mr Speaker, it is not parliamentary, and uh, those standards should be upheld. I, uh, I respect the Leader of the House's uh, view in this matter. However, I listened carefully. I did hear the comment. And my interpretation of what I heard, although poorly framed, was congenital line. And uh, I shall endeavour to. Well, uh, I'm more than happy to l l listen. No, I'm very happy to listen to the tape. And I'm very happy to consult with Hansard. And in the event that. Uh, the words alleged by the minister uh, have been used, then I will demand the member for Kingsford Smith withdraw. But if the member for Kingsford Smith wants to uh, pursue the point this, further, what I said, Mr. Speaker, was this is a congenital lie. I was accused of calling lie. lie. I was accused of calling the minister a congenital liar. I said I did not say that. If the, if the minister if, would if, like me to withdraw the word lie, I'm quite happy to do so when I do so.
Smith, and I thank the Honourable Member for Kingford Smith. Uh, we've tidied up that affair. The, uh, the Honourable Member for Peakley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer inform the House of the results of the September quarter survey of private new capital expenditure? And how do the expectations for 1997-98 compare with the budget forecasts? The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for Petrie for, uh, for her question, and uh, I know her interest in uh, the state of the Australian economy. She'll be very pleased to know that uh, the private new capital expenditure figures released for the September quarter uh, today show very strong investment expectations over the course of the next year, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. The Speaker member for Canberra. I, uh, and, and of course, everybody, everybody in Australia will welcome strong investment expectations, won't they? Won't they, Mr. Speaker? Uh, poor old Labor Party. The, the, uh, another bad day for the Labor Party. Good news for Australia. A bad day for the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. Actually, uh, intervening in the way that they did, Mr. Speaker. Investment intentions were considerably stronger for business investment in 1997-98 reflecting very strong expected growth in equipment, which I'm sure all Australians will welcome, Mr Speaker. The uh, investment intentions shown for the 1997-98 year are at least equal to the budget outlook for firm growth of nearly 8 per cent over 1997-98, Mr Speaker. These are particularly pleasing uh, to all of, uh, all of Australia, with, uh, with the exception of the ALP interjectors. Uh, Miserable, miserable day for the ALP again, Mr. Speaker, uh, because these were taken during a period of stock market instability during October, which would have been expected to have some depressing effect on expectations, uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> and the deputy leader of the opposition very disappointedly said it was taken before it was taken before the extension of the crisis to North Asia. If only it had been taken after, the figures would have been a little worse. Is that your point? If only they'd taken it after, we could have had some worse figures. Here we have a desperate Australian Labor Party running around trying to move every parameter they can to try and get bad news. Why do you want bad news for Australia? What a mean-spirited negative lot you are. What a mean-spirited negative lot running around, Mr Speaker, saying, oh, oh, good news, but if only if it had happened after North Asia. What, are you happy about North Asia? Are you happy about North Asia? The deputy leader of the You'd opposition. like that to be taken into account, would you, Mr. Speaker? The fourth estimate for equipment investment in 1997-98 is over 13 per cent higher. Is over 13 per cent higher than uh, the third estimate in July, August of 1997, and over 12 per cent higher than the equivalent estimate for 1996-97, Mr. Speaker. These are expected expenditures which show a very strong investment climate for Australia in 1997-98. And I think, Mr Speaker, all Australians will welcome a strong investment climate. A strong investment climate which comes off the back of low interest rates, which comes off the back of low inflation, which comes off the back of strong growth in the economy, which comes off the back of rising job opportunities, which comes off the back, Mr Speaker, of strong retail sales and which shows that in relation to the domestic economy uh, we, are, we are experiencing very strong conditions for the 1997-98 uh, year. Mr Speaker, uh, this is good news for Australia, good news in relation to investment, good news in relation to the climate and with the exception of the Australian Labor Party, Mr Speaker, to be welcomed by all Australians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the, the Treasurer is pretty easy, easily pleased the, with a four move, percent move quickly drop. To your question. He's getting to be like Dr. Kemp. We've got move Kemp facts. To we now have Costello facts. The question the is seat. to the Acting Prime Minister. <laughs> Acting Prime Minister, why did you tell the House yesterday that the Chair of the Cape York Land Council, Council Noel Pearson, had issued a native title claim of exclusive possession? on a pastoral lease, contrary to the High Court's decision that pastoralist rights prevailed over native title, when Mr Pearson had not done so. Yeah. Isn't it a fact that each of the relevant four leases in the Cow Power Holdings area 
has been cancelled and that, in other words, they no longer existed and the status of the land was therefore unallocated state or crown land, perfectly claimable under the WIC judgment. Did the Prime Minister intend to mislead the public, or was it that, like his senior policy adviser, he just didn't know what he's on about? The acting I Prime have, Minister. Uh, oh. I, ha I happen to have the Register of Native Title Claims, C0065, sorry, C00655, in my hand. And uh, I, I would just make two points in response to the Leader of the Opposition. I have been around, lot, I warn I've been in around long enough to know that you must not seek to mislead on the floor of this House. And so yesterday I said, I think I'll check the hand side, I used a phrase they were leases in transition, but in fact I'm also advised since yesterday, uh, I'm also advised uh, since yesterday the position is by no means clear and that in respect of at least one of those leases it, there is a possibility that the pastoral leaseholder has been issued with a permit to continue to live on that pastoral lease. But all I can do is put to the House what is in my hand, and that, and that states, that states at the bottom of page one of this claim, and I think the House is entitled to know, the right to possession of the land, waters, and the resources and attributes of the lands and waters to the exclusion of all others. There is the claim. There is the uh, whole point, which uh, stacks up in respect of what I said. Now. I would say this of Mr Pearson. I respect his intellect. I respect his capability to present uh, his case uh, with great uh, uh, aggressiveness. I do not respect him for calling me racist scum, and nobody else thanks him for that uh, introduction of that terminology into this uh, uh, debate. And I would say uh, further, Mr Speaker, that uh, it is an ambit claim in respect of a large section of Cape Order. York. It is a claim for the use of the land to the exclusion of all others. And that whilst uh, I object to ambit claims, and I note he says he objects to ambit claims, he said something else, that he was not going to proceed uh, with a raft of these types of claims, and of course he continues to, to proceed with those claims. There is one correction I'll give. He was not the only signatory on the claim. There were many other signatories of the claim, and I'm prepared to fully state that uh, before the House as well. Can I just say, Mr Speaker, on matters Wick, on matters Marbo, this is a seminal debate for the nation as a whole. And the nation has a right to be interested in what is at stake here and the outcome that the go government seeks by way of its legislation. I accept that we ought to get it right for the benefit of mainstream Australia and for all Australians and all groupings of Australians, including the Aboriginal people and the leaseholders. I respect the fact that the Aboriginal people have a deep-seated spiritual interest in their land, and that is also capable of being the case with regard to pastoral leaseholders as well, having a deep and abiding spiritual interest of the land. It is not our fault that the High Court of this land ruled by the narrowest margins, four to three, in respect of WIC and uh, created the coexistence of title situation, which is so impossible and impractical. But we are going to fix it up. We are going to provide for certainty and jobs, and we are going to stand up the Labor scaremongering on the issue. The Honourable Member for Fisher. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Treasurer. Uh, can the Treasurer advise the House what steps are being taken to provide a framework for currency stability in the Asian region? The Honourable Treasurer. Thank the uh, Honourable Member Fisher for his uh, question. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, a meeting of finance secretaries and central bank officials took place in Manila on the 19th and 20th of November <coughs> to discuss uh, financial instability in the South East and North Asian region. Uh, at that meeting, a new mechanism, it was resolved that a new mechanism be established for regional surveillance and for dialogue and information exchange between the ministries and banks concerned, with support from the IMF, World Bank and Asian Development Bank. It was agreed that a cooperative regional financing arrangement be developed where participants would provide, in consultation with the International Monetary Fund, supplementary financing on a case-by-case -case basis for IMF-supported programs. And it was also resolved that the IMF establish, 
examine the possible establishment of a new mechanism to provide short-term financing to augment traditional IMF financing. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, on Monday and Tuesday of next week, a meeting of ministers, ASEAN finance ministers and uh, six other countries, including uh, China, Hong Kong, Australia, South Korea, uh, the United States, uh, will be meeting together to consider the work of the deputies and to endorse these proposals. In addition to that, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, members of the House will be interested to learn that at the APEC Leaders Forum in Vancouver, uh, it was suggested that uh, early next year there be a meeting between APEC finance ministers and European finance ministers to actually discuss uh, developments and ways in which initiatives could be ways in which initiatives could be developed to deal with the currency instability in the region. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, from Australia's point of view, Australia has been actively involved in all of these regional initiatives. Uh, we have uh, uh, contributed uh, to a package, an IMF-led package, in relation to Thailand. We have uh, announced our availability for second-tier financing in relation to uh, Indonesia. And uh, there will be discussions uh, between all of the finance ministers concerned at meetings starting uh, early next week. Uh, from the point of view of Australia, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I've said before, uh, a downturn in the South East or North Asian region affects Australia. It affects our exports and it affects our jobs. It is not only in the interest of the region, but it is in the interest of Australia to see financial stability returned to the region and economic growth strengthened. That is why Australia is taking the position that it is in relation to these regional initiatives. Uh, that is why we are contributing uh, both with expertise and in relation to those two packages agreed to uh, with the uh, announcement of uh, loan funds to help the adjustment process in relation to those countries. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, it also, the events in South East and North Asia also demonstrate uh, the importance of adequate policy responses in advance. Uh, they underline the importance, Mr Speaker, of governments attending both to fiscal positions and to their current account and trading positions. It also under, underpins the importance of open, transparent and well-regulated financial systems. The developments which are occurring in Asia uh, are as much financial regulation problems uh, as they are general economic problems, and it will be considerable adjustment required in relation to financial supervision that will be required to get those countries back to strong growth. Uh, from Australia's point of view, we have an interest as a good neighbour in the region. We have an interest as a nation in stabilising the situation in South East and North Asia, and we will be making a major contribution in relation to that at the meetings to come early next week. The Honourable Member for more. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Minister, I have been advised by the directors of a WA small business that the AMP has advised them that their superannuation fund, which supports 30 of their employees, will be required to absorb up to $11,000 annually in costs to administer the superannuation surcharge, including $3,000 for an actuarial certificate alone to allow for the provision of an estimated $6,000 in surcharge to the government from the one or possibly two employees liable to pay the surcharge. Minister, how does this situation sit with the government's promise to reduce administrative burden on small business? The Honourable Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Um, Mr Speaker, the, um, the government has introduced uh, some important reforms to the <coughs> superannuation system to provide for a fairer system. Uh, in, the, in the level of taxes that uh, people pay. And the fact is that the system that we uh, uh, inherited from the previous government uh, provided a very significant tax advantage for people on high incomes. And that was not a fair system. And we also inherited a $10 billion deficit uh, that needed to be addressed. And I'll tell you why it needed to be addressed. Because if the government was not able to get its uh, house in order and finances in order, we would not have seen the fantastic reductions in interest rates providing real benefits to the people that you refer to. I mean, if you go back, and, and some people have short memories, but not on this side of the House, go, go back to the, early, uh, uh, to the late 80s and the early 90s, 
and you would have find uh, you would find small business paying you know 15 18 20 21 22 23 percent interest rates and and when and, and when labor was in, when labor was in in uh, government and when we went to the 96 election one of the strongest claims upon us as an incoming government was to get this nation's finances back in order to finally give some real assistance to the small business community. Now, obviously, there are administration costs involved in the scheme that we've introduced, but we, as a government, have been committed to reducing the paper workload for the small business community. Just, for example, in the area of uh, ABS collections, we've seen a significant reduction in the uh, red tape uh, burdens on the small business community. In my area of industrial relations, uh, with the transfer of industrial jurisdiction from the Victorian government to, and Victorian parliament to the federal parliament, we did not just remove a few forms, we removed a complete and entire layer of red tape which has been in the system since the commencement of, of federation. So, Mr Speaker, when it comes to red tape for small business, uh, the fact is this uh, government has got the runs on the board and we are committed to going further. The order. The honourable member for Swan. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Can the minister inform the House of the changes to assistance for job seekers occurring next Monday, the 1st of December? How will these changes improve the services for the unemployed and get more people into jobs? The honourable minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for Swan for his question. This government is determined to address effectively the tragic legacy of unemployment left by the Labor Party. And uh, we're doing that, of course, by bringing through, by bringing through uh, increasing numbers of real jobs. The, the government is, all, is also determined to um, address effectively Isaac. the quality of assistance to unemployed people. And, uh, next Monday, the 1st of December, Mr Speaker, uh, marks the beginning of the government's overhaul of the way that unemployed people are helped into jobs. I can announce that uh, from next Monday, $16.2 million of Commonwealth funds will be available to 300 private and community agencies to find jobs for 65,000 unemployed people between the 1st of December and May next year. This is the first time ever, Mr Speaker, that the federal government funds have been provided to private agencies to place unemployed people in jobs. These 300 agencies, or probably somewhat over 300 agencies, will be in direct competition with the Commonwealth Employment Service in the provision of job placement services. These, uh, this reform will help to place more unemployed people into jobs. It will do that because, firstly, because firstly, these agencies will have access to many more job vacancies than the CES. The CES has access to only some 20 per cent of job vacancies, and of course it is trying to place the bulk of unemployed people using its services into that 20 per cent of vacancies. So the first thing the government is doing is expanding significantly the number of vacancies that will be available for unemployed people. Secondly, the uh, job placement services will be uh, using the expertise uh, of people throughout the private and community sector in these agencies to provide these job placement services. And assistance for the first time will be tailored to the needs of the unemployed person, because a very significant feature of the reforms the government is putting in place is that we are moving away from the rigid program structure that uh, was so characteristic of the working nation programs of the Labor Party. Instead of unemployed people being placed and in many cases forced into these programs, whether or not there was a job at the end, for the first time now agencies will be paid when they place someone in a job and the assistance that they provide will be assistance that is best tailored to meet the job needs of the individual person. So we are seeing a very significant improvement 
in the job placement services that will be available to unemployed people. From uh, the 1st of May next year, the CES network as a whole will be replaced by improved services for unemployed people by contracting out the $1.7 billion that would flow through the CES over the 19 months following that time if the Labor Party had been in power out to community and private job placement agencies that will be paid not for program placements but will be paid for getting people into jobs. And this puts the end. It drives the nail finally into the coffin of working nation and its inefficient, demoralising, expensive job placement programs which failed utterly to provide the sort of support that unemployed people need. And the Leader of the Opposition knows this because, because in Perth Radio earlier this year he admitted that, and I quote, it is true that out of a lot of training programs people didn't get a job at the end of them. But that hasn't stopped the Labor Party in its new draft platform bringing right back these labour market programs that failed, reviving the $10 billion failed Working Nation program because they have run completely out of ideas about how to help unemployed people into jobs. And the government recognises that there is a huge equity issue to be tackled here. We are putting into place the equity programs that will give unemployed people the chance they never had to get a job under the Labor Party. The Honourable Member for Perth. Oh, man. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Acting Prime Minister. Yesterday, the Acting Prime Minister agreed with the assertion that the $630 million Western Australian Yakubinti Nickel project was, quote, effectively vetoed, unquote, as a result of overlapping native title claims, ending any immediate or significant development of the project. Is it not the case that the project has now been put on hold, not for this reason, but as a result of Dominion Mining's inability to raise the funds needed to lock its joint venture partner, the Korean Dilo Corporation, inability to raise the funds needed to lock its joint venture partner, the Korean Dilo Corporation, into the project as a consequence of the slump in the world nickel price, the Asian economic price, and the resultant share market nervousness crippling Dominion's fundraising drive. The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. Speaker. Oh. Members on my left. I'm very. I'm the Speaker. Acting Prime Minister will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Chifley on a order. legitimate point of order. Almost oh, definitely. Mr Speaker, could I draw your attention to the fact that the Honourable Member for O'Connor is interjecting and not in his place? Highly disorderly. I've, I've cited the Honourable Member for O'Connor. He is already under warning today and I'm sure uh, with great deliberation he's re returning to his seat to uphold the honour and uh, propriety of the parliament. Acting Prime Minister. <laughs> Speaker, I have uh, to put to the Member for Perth, I thank him for his question, that there are a range of considerations which brought about uh, the decision announced by the company uh, with regard to Yakamindi uh, yesterday. And perhaps one of those which might have indirectly had bearing was what happened at Bremer Bay in Western Australia. Because what happened at Bremer Bay, I think members, many of you are about to hear for the first time. An auction was set down Order for the seventh. This is Western Australia. Act, acting Western Prime Australia. Minister, resume your seat. The Honourable Member Mr. of Perth. Mr. On a Speaker, point of my question was a very specific question in respect of a nickel There's project. No point of, or, nothing to return, do with Bremer Bay. Return to your seat. The Acting Prime Minister. It has everything to do with Western Australia and indeed the very question you have invite. Right. A member for Hotham. Bremer Lots 695 to 730 were listed for public auction on the 7th of October 1995. The land in question had been subdivided and serviced in 1993 prior to the commencement the of the Commonwealth Native Title Act. Act. Acting Prime Minister resume his seat, the Leader of the Mr. Opposition Speaker, on the point of order. I take a point of order and it clearly goes to relevance. What on earth has this got to do with the Yakabindi <coughs> claim, the, uh, the claim he made yesterday and the question that deals with the Korean Daewoo Corporation's inability no, I, I to think, raise funds I think in relation the, uh, to their the situation uh, to confront as a result of the Asian economic I, crisis? 
There is no point of order, but I'm sure the uh, acting Prime Minister is uh, about to address, address the thrust of the principal question. It has everything. It has everything to do with the legitimate issue of sovereign risk, to which Australia is fully exposed. And in respect of this, on that auction day, you don't like this what? because you want to put in jeopardy freehold, and we don't. The acting Prime Minister is in seat, the Leader of the Opposition. Re relevance on a point is of stretched order. very broadly, and I understand why you'd follow precedent on that. But there is also precedent for asking ministers to come back to the point when they're so far away off it that they is, make themselves there is no, ridiculous. No point of order. I'm listening very carefully to the acting Prime Minister's Thank response you. and urging Mr. Speaker, to address 27 the lots question. sold at auction and are the conditions of sale a freehold title issue. The freehold title issued to the purchases under payment of purchase money. It's now a matter of public record that those freehold lots were subject to a native title claim on the 4th of October 1995, a fact and an incident which could have had influence on the mining companies the of acting, Western Australia. The acting Prime Minister will resume his seat. The I mean, humorous, the I accept that, but this is so far off the question that was asked. <laughs> I mean, and he's had now two or three minutes worth of going at it. Surely he could either be brought back to the point or sat down. There is, there is no point of order. The acting Prime Minister is using. Uh, existing precedents to embellish an order, and I do uh, invite the Acting Prime Minister to resume his answer to this complex What our question. legislation seeks to do is provide certainty for mining, the mining industry, for Aboriginal people, for leaseholders, particularly pastoral leaseholders, and jobs for Australians. And that is why the sooner our legislation is in place, the better prospect there is for that mining project in Western Australia. The Honourable Member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is addressed to the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Minister, in the lead-up to the election of the Coalition Government last year, there were many statements made that industrial relations disputes would increase. Can you inform the House of the, uh, the effect that the Workplace Relations Act has had on the industrial climate in Australia? The Honourable Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for uh, Robertson for his uh, question. The, uh, I do remember those uh, headlines after a speech by uh, the Secretary of the ACTU. And, uh, members uh, may remember uh, we'll go to war for pay rises. Kelsey. And uh, unions prepare for war in the age. And uh, this was Bill Kelty. Remember the thousand shop stewards in the Melbourne Town Hall, and there was uh, in the Australian. Kelty warns Howard it's war over wages, and uh, ACTU threatens wages push if uh, coalition wins. And then the day after, uh, the day Fraser. after those headlines, members might uh, remember the uh, remarks of the uh, member for Hotham, momentarily absent from the chamber, perhaps explaining the quieter tone in the place at the moment. <laughs> and uh, this headline was, Crean backs wage war threat, and followed up with uh, memorable lines such as, uh, uh, when asked about Mr Kelty's uh, promise of uh, wage claims and industrial war, etc., he said, I think they are statements of reality. And further, you'll get interest rates up and inflation up. That's a recipe for economic chaos, Mr Crean said. Mr Crean made it clear the blame, the blame for industrial and economic consequences he expected should be laid at the coalition's door. Well, Mr Speaker, when the last set of monthly industrial disputes uh, figures came out, I, I was rather interested in the results, so I asked my department to do a bit of research so we could actually see what has been happening. Because Mr Crean said, well, the blame would be at our feet. And Mr Speaker, I thought it was time that I stood up and accepted it. Time, time it was accepted, because the figures are very interesting indeed. These are the official figures from the Australian Bureau of Statistic, Statistics. Mr uh, Speaker, you can count the number of industrial disputes by either the number of disputes or the numbers of working days lost per thousand employees. So I've got both lots of stats for you. Uh, the first lot showed that in 1996 we had the lowest number of industrial disputes since 1940. Since 1940. 
We didn't have World War III. We went back to 1940. 1940. The latest figures show. The latest figures show that working days lost. That working days lost per thousand employees for the 12 months to August 1997 is lower than for any comparable period during the whole 13 years of the previous government. We have the lowest number of actual disputes in 1996 since 1940, and we have a lower number of days working lost than anything that the Labor Party achieved. Than anything that the Labor Party achieved, Mr. Speaker, on the number of disputes, on the number of disputes. The latest figures show we are on target for an even lower number of disputes this year than we did uh, in that whole period, which is a quite incredible result. In terms of uh, the figures uh, being lower than they were for the whole of Labor's period, in fact it goes back much further than that, the figures for the 12 months to August are also lower than any previous annual figures since the ABS began compiling these figures in 1967. 1967. So you can go back all the way 30 years before the Vietnam War, <laughs> before its conclusion, uh, back to 1967. Mr Speaker, in terms of the working days lost, 1997 is on target to be the lowest since 1959. So, Mr Speaker, the, the reality is that the legislation that we have introduced has encouraged people to take a cooperative attitude to the way in which they deal with uh, wages and conditions. And, and obviously, one of the chief objectives of our legislation is not only to encourage a sort of cooperative attitude to work, but the benefits of that are there for all to see. Not only do we reduce the number of disputes, and therefore the lost wages, which are, always, which are of course borne by employees. We improve Australia's reputation as a reliable supplier, so that means we're likely to get more export contracts. That means more jobs and higher living standards. But immediately, as people take a more cooperative attitude to work, then it gives them a chance to do a deal where they can take home more pay. And so, Mr Speaker, rather than inflation being up, inflation's down, rather than there being economic chaos, in fact, we've had a good result in the time that we've been in. And rather than workers being at war, they are in fact better off with more dollars in their pockets. So, Mr. Speaker, it goes to show you uh, what incredible lies were told in the 1996 election and what the benefits of good government are for ordinary people, for working people, in the reforms that we've introduced. The Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer and it follows the answers he gave earlier both on investment expectations and the Asian economic situation. In the light of the deterioration in Asian economies which has now extended to North Asia and which President Clinton, among others, has described as a threat to the rate of world economic growth, what is the Treasurer's current estimate of the extent of the negative impact of all this on Australian growth and jobs next year? Is it realistic for investment expectations to be maintained at the level they may have been when tested just before the crisis extended to North Asia? Is it realistic to hope, if this was ever the case, for 4 per cent growth in 1998? Do you now expect lower growth than you forecast in the budget? The Honourable Treasurer. Well, um, I'll, uh, I'll try. I'll try and answer it uh, seriously, Mr. Speaker. The, um, the, uh, well, I will. I will. If you don't interject, Mr. Speaker, um, if the leader of the opposition doesn't interject, I'll try and answer it seriously. Uh, but that that would be that would be a different uh, event, uh, because uh, as I've said, I think. Mr. Speaker, the member for Hotham interjects. He reminds me of a sort of a cocky in a pet shop, you know. He's sort of cocky, cocky, what a cracker! Just transport, he says every time, you know, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, the, the question was in relation to, to, um, to uh, growth. As I've said on numbers of occasions, Mr Speaker, that uh, obviously there will be a downturn in South East Asia and indeed in North Asia in relation to the currency and financial crises. Uh, that will affect Australian exports. Exports are part of the Australian economy and that will have an effect on Australia. But uh, to attempt to quantify it would uh, be misleading at best because nobody knows the full extent of the fallout in Asia or the full extent of the fallout on Australia. And you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't make an assessment until, Mr Speaker, you are aware of the full fallout in relation to that. And um, I, I think I've said that on numbers of occasions, Mr Speaker, and the position is always the same. And what would be the point of making such an estimate? We will make an estimate uh, of growth in the Australian economy at the time of next Order. year's budget. Uh, that's the time in which we do it, and uh, that's the time that we'll put it out. And I can't see any significance in doing otherwise now. Uh, but what we can say in relation to the Australian economy is if you want uh, an indicator as to uh, where the Australian uh, economy is, you'll get the best indicator in the national accounts, which will be released next week. Uh, over the course of uh, this year, we've, uh, we've had in the last two quarters growth of about 1 per cent, which is consistent with an economy growing between 3 and 4, probably closer to 4 than 3. Uh, and by, Mr Speaker, as I've said before, that is very strong by world standards. Member for Brisbane. Uh, the other point that I'd just like to pick up on the, uh, the uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition's question was um, somehow uh, uh, we shouldn't trust the investment expectations because they were taken before the, the full brunt of uh, uh, the Asian um, uh, economy fallout. Uh, they were taken, Mr Speaker, at the time of the financial instability in Asia. And most people, the and the most people in Australia would have said that they would have affected investment expectations. And Mr. Speaker, most people in Australia would today say, "Wasn't it good that they didn't?" That's what people in Australia would say. Wasn't it good that there's strong investment investment intentions in Australia? I think all Australians would say that, apart from one, Mr. Speaker, apart from one. The Deputy Leader of the On the ground of relevance, he's answering a question I did not ask. I asked a question about the implications no of, of the seat. extension of the crisis to North Asia, not what it was in the first I part of October. Standing Order 304A in respect of the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I invoke Standing Order 304A in respect to the. Fine. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will leave the chamber forthwith. Order. I take this point of order. The, the, lead, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was exercising his right to raise with you a point of order on relevance. And the standing orders order. provide for relevance, Mr Speaker. They provide for relevance. And I invite now, the Leader of the Opposition to go and examine the standing orders in their Totality. Well, Mr. Speaker, is, is that your point of order? Mr. Speaker, the point of order is. Then my speaker, my point of order is a question to you, Mr. Speaker. Is there an entitlement upon members of this Parliament to raise questions in relation to the validity of somebody's answer in regard to relevance? There is no point of order. Resume your well, seat. Mr. Well, Mr. Well, Mr. Speaker, there is. There is no point there of is a, order. Section, section 145 permits a relevance, relevance the, to the be raised. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. Mr Speaker, I will resume my seat in I deference to you. I warn the Leader you. of the Opposition. I resume my seat in deference to you, Mr Speaker, but we want an understanding about our capacity to raise these issues in Parliament and we will persist in doing so till we get here. The Honourable Member for Macpherson well, I'm will sorry, resume Mr. his seat. Mr. The Treasurer on a point of order. The Treasurer had finished his answer or not. The Honourable Member ask. for Macpherson. He has. I don't think he's finished. No. Oh no, Mr Speaker, I'm still going. Early today, the member for O'Connor, who has continued to interject and indeed was interjecting no when the Leader of, of the Opposition was seat. on his defeat. I if have it's warned fair the enough, member for O'Connor uh, hitherto. If he, well, if he, not we're not, not going to debate the issue. Resume your seat. Resume your seat.
the Honourable Member for Dobell on a point of order. My point of order, Mr Speaker, is that having given the call to the Member for McPherson, you cannot now take that away and return it to the Treasurer. There is no point of order. The Treasurer had not completed an answer and was kind enough to remind me of the circumstances regarding the conclusion of his answer. The Treasurer. Thank, th thank you, Mr Speaker. I was, I was coming precisely to the question that I was asked by the, uh, the honourable member for Holt, uh, which, which, Mr Speaker, was somehow because, uh, because the investment expectations were taken at a time of instability in Asia, we couldn't believe them or we couldn't believe them fully. Now, they were the investment intentions which were taken at the time of the survey. They were taken at the time when the fallout was uh, uh, very clear in South East Asia. And, Mr Speaker, I think all Australians, with the possible exception of the Australian Labor Party, would say, wasn't it a good thing that Australian firms, knowing what they did, still had strong investment intentions? And, and wouldn't that be a good thing? And why would anybody go around why would anybody go around, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition did, and say, and say well, look, don't think that there are good investment intentions because if you'd timed it differently, we could have actually had a bad result, and a bad result would be a good result for the Australian Labor Party. I just don't understand the negativism, the anti australianness of this negative way in which the Australian Labor Party is now operating, Mr Speaker. But, uh, but uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I do point out that um, uh, perhaps while the Deputy Leader of the, uh, the Opposition is outside, he will think about that and he will actually welcome the fact that we have uh, strong investment intentions in Australia, and maybe even his leader of the opposition will rethink his position too and welcome investment and jobs and growth and all of the things that this government is about producing for the Australian people. Order. The Honourable Member for McPherson. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. My uh, question without notice is to the Minister for Defence. Has the uh, minister seen recent proposals regarding Australia's defence capability? How do these proposals compare with those of the government? The Honourable Minister for Defence. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for McPherson for his question, Mr Speaker. I have seen uh, a document which purports to be the ALP platform for the Australia's Armed Forces, which no doubt was authorised by the member for Brisbane. And I expected to see uh, some substance in that document and some ideas. But uh, Labor's uh, master plan for capability, as he described it, uh, that is the structure, the equipment, the readiness, uh, the sustainability of the Army and the Navy and the Air Force, the planning and the resource fr uh, resourcing framework which underpins all of those things, amounted to 11 and a half lines. Even, even the member for Reid, who uh, as the newly appointed uh, Shadow Minister for Defence, Science and Personnel managed to get 70 lines over in the 17 paragraphs that he put forward. And uh, I, I, it's extremely disappointing, Mr. Mr Speaker, because when you initiate, when you initiate something like the Army into the 21st century and the Defence Reform Program, you would expect to see a platform that had some substance in it. I suppose. Uh, that those three scant paragraphs that the member put forward is nothing different from Labor's record in the past, which resulted in uh, hollow hulls and empty platforms. As I have said before, and people have recognised in the past, the policy of, of, of fitted for but not with. I have often thought the member for Brisbane was similarly fitted, Mr Speaker. The difference, of course, is that we, can, we, can spend, we spend enough money, we can, fit, we can fix the hulls. Nothing can be done for the member for Brisbane. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be too surprised, uh, Mr Speaker. After all, this policy is a, is, a, is a platform from the party whose unofficial defence spokesperson, Senator Reynolds, uh, in the US the other day, opposes the US alliance, wants defence cut by 5 per cent, and who says, and I quote, that our priorities will be right when the Department of Defence has to have a cake sale to raise money for its battleships. Well, that's one of your members up there speaking away in the Senate. In regard to the second part of the member's question, Mr Speaker, I, I can only assume that uh, these policies uh, do not uh, differ from the Coalition's policies. There is not one word of criticism in the platform about the Coalition's policy. That's the first reason. And the second, uh, you know what they are. And the second reason, the second reason, Mr. Speaker, is that the uh, member for Brisbane has recently applied uh, to become a member of the coalition. 
Uh, yes, he wrote to me on the 17th of November uh, and again on the 18th of November. Uh, this, the Honourable Arch Bevis MP, Federal Member for Brisbane, corner of Days and Grange Roads, Grange, Brisbane. Uh, parliamentary Secretary to the, member, uh, to the Minister of Defence. And uh, I, I will put that application forward to our backbench, uh, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure they will consider it, but not for long. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Brisbane. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My, my, question, my question without notice is to the Minister for Defence. Minister, earlier this year you unsuccessfully urged your Cabinet colleagues to cancel the proposed purchase by the Australian Navy of the Australian-designed offshore patrol craft, the same design that was bid for Malaysia but which was recently beaten by a German bid. Minister, did you also instruct the Secretary of your department, Mr Tony Ayres, to inform the Malaysian authorities that any Australian naval purchase of the offshore patrol craft would be equipped for peacetime tasks only, that is, effectively without any weapons? and that he should make no commitments at all about the number of vessels that Australia would buy. How could you possibly justify undermining such an important Australian naval and industrial project? And, Minister, if you weren't going to support the Australian-designed ships, how on earth did you ever think the Malaysians would? Yeah. The Hon. Minister for Defence. Well, the Bizjet Beasley doing his usual interventions. I think the member for. I, I thank the member for. I thank the, the member for, for Brisbane for his annual question. I've, uh, <laughs> as you know, the Mr. Speaker, as everybody in this chamber question. knows, the Transfield bid was a very professional bid. It offered a vessel, vessel specifically designed for regional conditions. It was a collaborative joint project uh, which had advantages for both the Malaysians and the Australian navies. And the decision was one properly for the Malaysian government. I, don't, I, do not intend, I do not intend to comment on anything that might have happened in the Cabinet. And, and all I can say to you is that via, via, via the Prime Minister and via the Treasurer, who is in Malaysia in weeks prior to their decision, prior, via, via the Secretary of my department, we gave great support to that project. Member for the but I will say this, uh, Mr Speaker, that the government is currently reviewing uh, its overall strategic and investment priorities. There are, there are pressures from other ADF investment proposals, and I think it is, it is worth recording the, the quote I mean, this is a bit of revisionism on your part the quote by the Shadow Minister for Defence, uh, who said, We've just seen the Malaysian government decide not to go ahead with buying an offshore patrol boat that was designed here in Australia. Now, instead of looking for the bigger ship, that is that ship. Uh, that, we were that we were discussing with Malaysia, you said we've now got an opportunity to rethink all that. The order. Order. The honourable member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I refer the Minister to talks in Cairns regarding the conflict in Bougainville. What was the outcome of the talks? What is Australia's role in helping to resolve the long-standing conflict in Bougainville? And have recent events in Papua New Guinea had any impact on the peace process? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, first of all, I thank the Honourable Member for Boothby for his question, because I know the Member for Boothby has a very great interest in Australia's, uh, Australia's foreign policy. And I'm particularly pleased with um, the interest that he's shown in establishing the, uh, the Casey Group. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to uh, report to the House that uh, the meeting in Cairns between the 19th and the 24th of November between the parties uh, involved in the tragic Bougainville conflict was a meeting which made important progress in advancing the current peace efforts. I myself went to Cairns on the 19th and the 20th of November and had the opportunity to discuss the matter with all of the, uh, part, well, with many of the participants um, there as well. The Australian government um, is very happy to be able to uh, play a role in facilitating the peace process. In the case of the 
Cairns Talks. We obviously provided the venue and we made the travel arrangements for around 50 delegates who, um, who attended. Mr Speaker, at the conclusion of the meeting, the parties issued what is known as the Cairns Commitment on the implementation of the agreement concerning the Neutral Regional Truce Monitoring Group for Bougainville. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, this, um, this commitment, which was endorsed by all parties to the peace process, declares um, the bodies and groups representable ensure the truce monitoring group is safe at all times for attack, from attack, interference and hindrance. And I know members on this side of the House would be very interested to, uh, to hear that particular commitment, because it's important to the Australians, above all, from our perspective as Australians, it's important to the Australians participating in that truce monitoring group. M Mr Speaker, the commitment also uh, um, uh, made it clear that uh, the parties will provide all possible assistance to the Truce Monitoring Group in performance of their mandate and all, uh, urge all other bodies, groups and persons under the authority um, to, do, uh, to do the same. So, Mr Speaker, the Cairns meeting was a very important stepping stone in uh, what is frankly a, a delicate and likely to be a long-running peace process. Um, Mr Speaker, I must say, if I, if I could um, just make this point, it does disappoint me, though, that the Australian Labor Party treats the Bougainville peace process with such uh, disdain. Such disdain. I know that uh, the uh, former spokesman, the, the current spokesman, you won't be the spokesman for long, I imagine, uh, regards the, uh, the previous foreign minister as a man who suffered from foreign policy fatigue and was happy to say so publicly, but I would have thought that the Labor Party would be interested in the efforts of many Australians to promote the Bougainville peace pro process, including this government, and would regard it as a serious matter. But clearly you are a party that doesn't take public policy issues seriously at all. Mr Speaker, um, the last point the honourable member raised in his question was um, to ask whether events in Papua New Guinea have in any implications for the peace process. Can I just say that Mr Speaker, I have seen reports of allegations made against the Papua New Guinea Prime Minister, Mr Scape, and can I make it clear that from the perspective of the Australian Government, this is of course a matter for Papua New Guinea, the Papua New Guinea Government, the Papua New Guinea Parliament and the people of Papua New Guinea, and it is not uh, appropriate it is not appropriate for the Australian Government to comment on those things. Papua New Guinea is an independent country making its own way um, in the world. Those al allegations will have no implications for the Australian Government's strong commitment to the current Bougainville peace process or to assist with the drought relief effort in Papua New Guinea. The Honourable Member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Sport and Tourism. Uh, Minister, I again refer you to the recent comments by Bruce Baird, the Managing Director of Tourism Council Australia, where he noted that up to 50,000 jobs could be lost in Australia's tourism industry due to the Asian economic crisis. Can the Minister confirm that the Government has cut the budget of the Australian Tourist Commission by approximately $18 million? Can the Minister also confirm that overseas visitor arrivals from Taiwan have fallen by 7 per cent, Southeast Asia by 9 per cent? Indonesia by 11 per cent and from Thailand by 63 per cent. Will the minister outline what strategy will adopt to turn around this alarming outlook for Australia's second largest export earning industry and to protect Australian jobs? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Sport and Tourism. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. It is uh, true that uh, since we last discussed this matter in question time, there have been one or two other developments in the markets and the uh, financial uh, stability in some of our neighbours, some of the countries you referred to. But as, the, as I said at that time, what is important is that we be realistic about this, not hysterical in any way, that we recognise that not all our eggs are in one basket in the tourism sense. You can have slow growth in markets that are low-yielding markets. You can also have high growth in markets that are high-yielding at the same time. And in that sense, I'd point you to figures from October, which indicate an increase in arrivals from the United Kingdom year on year of about 30 per cent. This is an extraordinary jump from a market that is generally more high-yielding than the ones you specified. Further, I'd indicate also the importance of the durability 
of Australia's brand as a tourist destination. And in that sense, let me simply say that it is very unhelpful in a, what is a very difficult and passionate debate taking place in this House, or I should say in this Parliament, concerning native title, for some players in that to be making statements using hysterical language, describing the government, for example, as racist scum, when these sort of statements go out on, on the wire services, travel all over the world and convey entirely the wrong impression about this country. I think the minister has concluded his answer. Uh, does the honourable member still wish to make a point? The honourable member for Indi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question, without notice, is to the Attorney General. It relates to the extraordinary stance taken by the opposition this week to vote against such a practical and worthwhile measure as the Judiciary Amendment Bill. Can the Attorney General tell the House what the implications will be for the Commonwealth? and other consumers of legal services if the bill is blocked by Labor and the Democrats in the Senate. How does this backflip by Labor compare with the stated aims and policies Order. of the Keating government? Order. Too much chat across the table. The Honourable Attorney-General. Backbench democracy. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Indi for his question. It seems the the opposition and the shadow in Attorney General Senator Bolkus in particular have a failing memory. The Senator left the member for Banks out on a limb, telling him to oppose the bill, the Judiciary Amendment Bill. One wonders what support was given by caucus to that opposition, and one wonders whether the Leader of the Opposition knew or approved of that, that opposition, and whether the Legal Committee knew anything about it. But the decision to oppose such a sensible bill is made re quite remarkable when you think of what it actually builds upon. It builds upon significant decisions taken by two of my recent predecessors, Michael Lavarch and Michael Duffy. What Senator Bolkus is doing is hampering the reform process that the Labor Party actually put in train. Senator Bolkus wants to prevent the Australian government solicitor from taking full advantage of opportunities in the government legal services market. In doing so, whether he knows it or not, he's placing at risk the ability of the AGS to compete with private law firms. The bill will mean that the Australian government solicitor, the government's own law firm, is placed in the best position to compete effectively in that market. It also means that consumers of legal services will benefit from competition through lower costs and more efficiency. Michael Duffy and Michael Lavarch opened up significant non-policy legal services to competition, but it seems Senator Bolkus doesn't know that, or at least didn't tell his caucus. Michael Duffy and Michael Lavarch knew that if departments had to pay for their legal services out of their own funds, they'd be more prudent and more selective in seeking that advice. Michael Lavarch, in a press release in 1994, said charging for legal services had a significant impact on use by departments and agencies. Introducing competition for the supply of government legal services is an important part of the reform agenda for the legal profession as a whole. One might ask, Mr Speaker, how the opposition position on this bill fits in with the Labor platform, the new platform, which has a heading, Community Security and Access to Justice. It says that the Labor Party has a policy to abolish anti-competitive practices engaged in by the legal profession. The opposition to that bill entirely opposes and ignores that policy. I wonder, did Senator Bolkus tell caucus about that point? Mr Speaker, we've got a backflip on a backflip on the previous government's policy and a belly flop on their new policy. <laughs> the honourable member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is again to the Minister for Sport and Tourism. Does the minister acknowledge that there will be severe implications for Australia's tourism industry, particularly in Queensland, 
as a result of the introduction of the second tranche of the reef tax due to come into effect on 1 January 1998. Is the Minister aware that in September 1995, in response to a proposal to increase taxes on the marine tourism industry, his colleague Senator Pera wrote, and I quote, the Coalition has made a public commitment not to increase or introduce any new taxes in the tourism industry. In the name of maintaining our export industries and to honour our publicly stated commitment to the tourism industry, this measure should not apply to the marine tourism industry. Minister, why have you ignored your own internal advice and imposed this job-destroying reef tax? The Honourable Minister for Sport and Tourism. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Once again, to my uh, honourable friend, thank you for another question. Uh, as regards the user charge on the reef, let me put that uh, in a larger context. What is important in the tourism industry is not simply the promotion of Australia as a destination, but of course also the profitability of the enterprises that work in that industry, many of them, of course, particularly small. So the reforms that this government has undertaken since taking office have gone squarely to that issue, especially in the area of industrial relations. And in that respect, I find it passing strange when I took some time to peruse the Labor Party's draft platform, this, uh, this poisonous document. And I, when I turned to the section about tourism. Order. The, the, minister, well, the minister will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition I, I realise the chances of actually getting anything through on this are remote, but I will raise the point of order on relevance. There's a highly specific set of questions on the reef tax, and now we're getting a general rave on the Labor Party's platform. There is no point of order. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, if, if you want to talk about the reef, we might have to talk about the native title claim over the reef as well. But I won't trespass into that area just yet. What I'll talk about, what I'd like to explain to the House, <coughs> is some of the phrases in the section on tourism in this draft platform, and in particular, a commitment to increase, to increase flexibility. Order. The minister will resume his seat. The honourable member for Hotham. it goes to relevance. This order. is beyond a joke. The question was specific. It was the reef tax. He's now going to Labor Party policy. Get him back to answering there the question. There is no point of order. Minister. Let me simply say that on the issue of the profitability of enterprises in the tourism industry, those enterprises, including those that pay the user charge over the reef, they too they too, of course, have an issue in trying their best to improve their profitability. One of the chief things, especially in service industries such as those in the tourist business, is, of course, the issue of industrial relations. Your platform maintains that you propose to introduce flexibility. Flexibility, ladies and gentlemen. Order. The minister will resume his seat. The leader of the this opposition. This is way out of relevance. Not even conceivable that this could be regarded as relevant. I have some sympathy with the uh, leader of the opposition's point. The minister will return to the thrust to of the question. To introduce flexibility in workplace relations. Minister. Flexibility. Minister, flexibility. Minister. minister. Minister, the digression from the thrust of the question is uh, bordering on the extreme. I do invite you to return to the thrust of the question. Indeed, and as, as they pay the user charge over the reef and they think about all that flexibility, they might also turn to another part of the platform that deals with industrial relations, where the Labor Party says... <laughs> The honourable member for Cunningham on a I mean, point of order. Mr Speaker, even I would have drawn the issue of relevance to the attention of the minister at this stage. The question, the question was specific about the reef tax. Four dollars per head per trip in a boat I think, every I person think, out I, to the reef. I, I very much remember uh, some of the well-established precedents you made. And one word constantly 
returns to my mind, and I think it was no point of order. <laughs> Although the minister would be unwise to test my patience much further. Right, well, we've had a bit of flexibility from the chair as well as from the Labor Party. I take your point, Mr. Speaker. All I say is that measures taken to restore profitability to the tourist industry, to enable Order. them to Member deal Paul. with issues such as the user charge, require not comprehensive award coverage in the tourist industry, but our sort of IR reform. The honourable member for La Trobe. Okay. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question without notice is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, could you please advise the House the difference in equity and efficiency between a value-added type broad-based consumption tax, a wholesale sales tax, and a point of sales tax? Have you heard reports that there are those in Australia who favour retaining our current wholesale sales tax? And can you advise the House how many other countries still utilise such a tax mechanism? The Honourable the Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for uh, Latrobe uh, for his uh, question. Uh, as somebody who uh, has extensive business uh, experience, he would know that one of the things that business really wants in this uh, country is tax reform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and particularly, uh, any party that uh, wanted to uh, support uh, manufacturers would want to reform the wholesale sales tax, wouldn't they? Yeah. Because the wholesale sales tax is one of the biggest burdens on manufacturers in this country. And I don't think there'd be any party, political party of goodwill that wouldn't be in favour of tax reform in Australia. Not, not one party of goodwill in Australia that would be against uh, tax reform. Uh, Mr Speaker, as it happens, I do, um, I do actually have a copy of the caucus briefing note from Gareth Evans, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and Shadow, Shadow Treasurer, on tax reform issues. And um, the first point is this. He's got a whole lot of questions and answers. The first one is, and I'll, I'll see if I can answer them. The first question is, is, is it true that Labor doesn't want to be part of the tax debate? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, I think that. Uh, the second one, is Labor looking backwards on tax reform? Yeah. Um, the third one, has Labor backflipped on GST since 1985? Yes. Will Labor vote for the GST if the coalition is elected? Yeah. Uh, 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 why does the Labor Party oppose the GST? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, uh, question six: Isn't the Australian tax system broke? And uh, then it goes on, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to uh, release that um, during the course of uh, the uh, the tax debate, and I'd thank uh, the member of the caucus who sent that to me because uh, uh, that will be uh, of great assistance. Now. <laughs> Mr Speaker, they aren't all against tax reform. I, uh, I, wanted, to tell you, uh, I wanted to tell you about that. Um, <laughs> Mr Speaker, but, um, but international work on, uh, on the tax system has, um, has actually uh, shown that um, multi-stage tax uh, is better than single stage because it's much harder to avoid. Uh, and uh, value-added taxes are better because they're much uh, simpler uh, and they do allow everybody throughout the chain of production to actually claim an input credit. The difficulties with our wholesale sales tax system is that there are so many exemptions and so many users. Uh, you've got to collect numbers, you've got to have classification problems, you have different rates. Uh, it's increased uh, complexity for small business. And one of the things about single rate multi-stage uh, taxes not only is simpler for business, uh, but they get inputs on all of their taxes, and taxes don't cascade through the system. Mr. Speaker, I think any party of goodwill that wanted to help our exporters would also want to rebate input taxes for exporters. At the moment, around the world, Mr. Speaker, uh, around the world, um, Australian uh, exporters uh, are putting their goods onto the world stage with taxes built into their price. And everybody else around the world is taking those taxes out, allowing their exporters the opportunity to compete on international markets. Mr Speaker, why would we penalise our exporters like that? Why, why would we refuse to reform a tax system that doesn't give them fair go? 
Mr. Speaker, uh, it is important to be part of the tax debate uh, in this country. We would have liked it if Labor could have been forward-thinking rather than reactive and negative uh, in relation to this issue. But it is important that there be leadership in relation to this, Mr. Speaker. And as uh, as usual, as yeah. usual, Mr. Treasurer Speaker, it will be the coalition that will be leading Treasurer and the coalition which will be taking the argument. And the coalition, Mr. Speaker, that will be standing to help manufacturers and exporters, manufacturers and exporters who deserve a fair go. Before I call the next question, uh, I'm always reluctant to send the honourable member for O'Connor home to Perth early, but your constant and continuing interjections this day has uh, even ensured that my patience has worn thin, and I invoke Standing Order 304A in respect to the member for O'Connor. The honourable member for Cunningham. I used to do that often, Mr. Speaker. Move quickly to your question. The, uh, Mr. Speaker, my, uh, my question is to the Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism. Can the Minister confirm that part of the uh, government's response to the Bell report in March this year was the establishment of the Small Business Innovation Fund? Can the Minister confirm that the guidelines have now been changed? and that the Small Business Innovation Fund has been renamed the Innovation Investment Fund to exclude small business and to concentrate solely on medium-sized enterprises with very high growth potential. Will fund managers in the new IIF still be announced in December 1997 as promised? Does this sleight of hand make a mockery of the government's pledge to small business? Was the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business consulted on this change, or was the SBIF, like many others, just a non-core promise? The Honourable Minister for Industry, Science and Tourism. Speaker, it's getting a bit lonely. Um, the, uh, the, question of the, innovation, the question of the innovation funds, Mr Speaker, is a, is a great step forward by the government in terms of harnessing risk capital to develop research and development projects in Australia. It's a great initiative by the government, and it is available both to small and medium-sized business, as well you'd know. So if you do your homework and read the statements, you'd understand the question. Right at this very moment, the applications are being judged by the Research and Development Committee, and I anticipate that the schedule will be met. But irrespective of the times and the dates, this particular initiative of the government is one which will do more for the development of research and development in Australia than the Labor's ever, Labor Party ever thought of doing. It's a remarkable achievement to be able to get the private sector to raise their money and to manage it and to pick their projects so that they can develop research and development in Australia to commercial outcomes for the benefit of the whole Australia. The Honourable Member for Capricornia. The Speaker. Is, uh, my question is uh, addressed to the Acting Prime Minister and Minister for Trade. Is the Acting Prime Minister aware of the success of Fitzroy River Meats in Rockhampton in electorate of Capricornia? This is a new company that has fallen on its feet because of good management and developed overseas markets. Is the Acting Prime Minister also aware that the company last week increased its production from 10 tonnes a week to 60 to 70 tonnes a week? The honourable acting Mr. prime minister. Speaker, the uh, member for Capricornia highlights another export breakthrough Order. of which he can be proud, and Australia can be proud, and Fitzroy River Meats can be proud. It is about effective linkage with regard to our export networks, and it flows in part from the operation of the Austrade office at Rockhampton, an outrigger office uh, manned by a Mr. Uh, Robert Armstrong. And it's one of a set of pilot associate officers operating in Wagga Wagga, Bathurst, Nowra, Coffs Harbour and, as I mentioned, Rockhampton. It's located in the business centre and is supported by the local shire councils, university and other local organisations, including chambers of commerce. It has a particular focus on the Pacific and PNG. And, of course, uh, what it is helping to do is for companies, small and large, around Rockhampton to identify export markets to uh, provide the linkage into getting into export and then to start exporting. So I'm delighted to learn of Fitzroy River Meats' breakthrough, uh, a further expansion in uh, meat industry exports uh, to uh, this part of the world. And I'd add one other thing uh, in respect of exports and the Export Market Development Grant Scheme and in that particular area around Yapoon and Rockhampton, we have given the tourism industry 
full access to the EMDG for the first time ever under the coalition government's efforts. The honourable member for Burke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is also to the Deputy Prime Minister. Deputy Prime Minister, we've already seen the cancellation of significant orders for live cattle from North Queensland and Northern Territory as a result of the currency devaluations in Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, what is the government doing to try to sustain Australia's agriculture and food processing opportunities in the face of the wider currency changes now beginning to emerge in the region? The Honourable Acting Prime Minister. Speaker, a very bland question at the end of uh, a successful set of question times for the coalition government, if I might say so. Can I, uh, can I uh, say uh, that uh, we are providing. Uh, Members are, on my left. Order. The, uh, we are providing real assistance to exporters in Northern Australia. Uh, we're doing that for a range of uh, activities. The Export Market Development Grant Scheme is one. The AAA package launched by my colleague, the Minister of Primary Industry, is another indirect uh, assistance to uh, put primary industry on the front foot and contend with all the tough circumstances and times which are confronted in primary production in Northern Australia and export activity in Northern Australia. Mr. Speaker, I would add that uh, it is certainly uh, not easy uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, adjust to all that. Uh, is happening in the course of October and November 1997 in a number of our trading partners. It is a very serious situation in relation to Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand and Malaysia, and now more broadly in relation to events in Korea and Japan. So the Australian government uh, is conscious of the need to look at every possible step which we can responsibly take to uh, ease the burden of the situation. I join with the Treasurer in reiterating that Australia is better placed to weather the storm as a consequence of our macro policy settings on the economic front, our fiscal policy, our five consecutive lowerings of interest rates and the other steps which have been taken to uh, provide a more competitive circumstance for our exporters. But, uh, Mr Speaker, I note that the Chief Minister Shane Stone has uh, commented that what is making it very difficult for investment and uh, inter alia export activity is the whole question of uh, jeopardy that uh, has been created by native title and the need to have our native title legislation through. And it will help greatly if the Senate gets on with that uh, particular piece of legislation. I've finished. The, the, uh, on the, board, the Acting Prime Minister has concluded his uh, answer. The, the Honourable Member for Macon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Minister for the Status of Women. Can the Minister advise the House whether the Coalition Government will reconsider its position not to introduce quotas to increase the number of women in Parliament? The Honourable Minister for the Status of Women. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, we have achieved Member outstanding results uh, in this place without quotas, and uh, we do not intend applying a quota system. And I do thank the uh, member for Macon for her question. You only have to take a quick glance around this place and it's quite easy to see which of the parties has a genuine commitment to increasing the number of women in parliament. It's the coalition, Order. the parties, the parties without quotas, Mr Speaker. We've got 18 women sitting on our benches in this place. We've got four sitting opposite. And it's not that Labor women aren't trying. It's not that they're not trying, and it's not that Labor women aren't interested. The Labor Party just doesn't have the political will to achieve their own targets. As recently as last week, in its policy platform, released with the f with the, without the full endorsement of their, of their own party, in commitment number 22, chapter 11, it says Labor will increase the representation of women in Parliament. Well, I have to say, Mr Speaker, this rings pretty hollow. They're just words again, because you only have to look at Labor's actions to see that there is no genuine commitment to women at all. There have been ample opportunities in recent weeks for them to pre-select women. There's been Mitchum, Jalibrand, Bowman, Lilly. In all these seats, the Labor boys have closed ranks and shut the women out. Yeah. It is. Uh, 
It was even reported uh, that the Leader of the Opposition called in the big guns and flew LL ALP uh, National Secretary Gary Gray to Perth oh. to help beat off attempts to, uh, uh, by Helen Creed to contest him for his own seat of Swan. And, uh, <laughs> And Mr Speaker, I read in this morning's West Australian, ALP backslides on women for Cowan. election, says Elder States woman, woman Pat Giles. So that was the headline this morning. And uh, Mr Beasley came under fire also for dumping a high-profile woman candidate for the seat of Jallybrand in favour of a man. His, his, what, but what was his response to the criticism, Mr Speaker? It was to dump the man as well and reopen nominations to cover himself. Well, he's so transparent and this, their party is so transparent and women of Australia are not going to be fooled by them. Um, Labor has, of course, found La Labor has found one seat for women, of course, the seat of Dixon. And uh, again, the Labor women the were just not good enough. The Labor boys had to poach Cheryl Kerno from the Democrats. And this is a real slap in the face for Labor women. It is their party alone which is saying to Labor women, you don't matter, your views don't matter, your policy suggestions don't matter, we don't want you. That's what Labor is saying to women of Australia. That's what Labor is saying to women in this place. And so, Mr Speaker, when push comes to shove, Labor men get get pushed into Parliament and the women are shoved aside. The Acting Prime Minister. Order. Order. Mr Speaker, I ask Prime that uh, further questions be placed on notice and I seek uh, to add to it a question from the member for Perth. Uh, I'm advised Order. that a, I may proceed. Both yeah. Speaker, I'm advised that a Mr Ken Dredge of Dominion Mining has provided information to a member of the government and I quote they could not get overseas funding because of a title the uncertainty Melbourne. arising from native title claims. To assist the member for Perth, I pass that information on to the House. Thank you, Prime Minister. Supplementary. Government member. Supplementary. No. No. It wasn't Wilson's tucky, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Order. 